First of all, we'd like, can you hear me? <laughs> uh, we'd like to welcome all of you to the second uh, AYA, Anafora Young Adults uh, Meeting, um, which was inaugurated last month at St. Abanuk Church with His Eminence and Their Graces. And uh, today, as you know, we're the, sec we're the second uh, meeting here in, in our blessed church. Welcome, everyone. We'd like to welcome um, His Grace Bishop Suriel coming all the way to us from Australia, um, and His Grace Bishop Krilos, who will give us the talk, and our blessed fathers, um, and all of you, of course. <clears throat> so I hope uh, the technology is working properly, and we'll hear uh, uh, an introduction from His Grace. Welcome, Sayyid. Hello, everyone. I'm not sure if you can uh, see and hear, but it's uh, a great joy to join you for a moment from sunny Sydney, Australia. I welcome His Grace Bishop Corraldos and thank him for uh, presenting this spiritual meeting today on the Stations of the Cross. And it's very appropriate um, as we uh, prepare for Pascha week. Uh, and I wish all of you a blessed Pascha week and the Feast of the Resurrection. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you uh, today, but I look forward to being with you in our meeting in May. Uh, and I ask for your prayers, and I hope that you have uh, an enjoyable evening with His Grace Bishop Carlos, the Reverend Fathers, and the young adult leaders that are there. Uh, I wish you every success for the meeting and the activities afterwards, uh, and I hope that you all have a blessed uh, evening. Please pray for me. Thank you very much, Your Grace. We thank uh, His Grace uh, and uh, Father the Priest um, for his warm uh, invitation and welcome. Um, and for his warm welcome, uh, I feel humbled standing before two pillars, uh, you know, his eminence uh, from last month and for next month, his grace. So it's very difficult for me to speak. Uh, perhaps the topic is one uh, that is very dear to me, something that I started studying uh, deeply when I was around your age, which is not a short time. Um, and one that I hope that will inspire others to continue because this topic actually can help and guide us throughout our spiritual lives for many years. Actually, the fruit, the hundredfold fruit, is something that helps us in every part of our spiritual life if we can grasp um, its meaning and its understanding. Now, there are many ways to approach Holy Week, um, which I will not speak about, but just to give you an idea of why we chose this topic. Now, usually we'll uh, speak about the events and go through the different uh, things that had happened in Scripture and in the Gospel, like St. Theophilus, who says in the fourth century that if we meditate on the whippings and scourgings and 
his wounds and the different events, that it will be for us a great benefit. And we have uh, also the different events in uh, the Holy Week um, organized for us in this way so we can follow. And we have the prophecies that guide us throughout this. Um, we even have in the app, the, for the Spirit and Truth, some guidelines to help you to prepare for every hour. Another way is to go through different themes. Um, as usually the, your, your priests and in the sermons of Holy Week, that, that will be one way which we can benefit from. Right? If we meditate on one theme of love or of salvation or repentance throughout the days and the events of the week, it helps us give us a focus. Another way is about the types. So we are searching for Christ in the Old Testament and the fulfillment in the New. If someone has not read the scripture, and many times this will happen with the catechumens or someone who is new to the church and they just attend Holy Week, they will get an overview of all of the main readings in the Bible. And the goal is to find Christ, as I said, who is hidden in these types in the Old Testament. So that's also one approach. Another one um, is to go through different homilies or to meditate on one homily per day from the fathers. Uh, we put together a little book uh, a few years ago that could help also every day to, to just listen and reflect on one homily uh, that's appropriate to the day. Um, so <clears throat> there are different ways and different approaches. Another is to take personalities and meditate on one of the main figures of that, those events. And as St. Gregory uh, tells us that um, your meditation could be one day on St. Simon of Cyrene, another day on the thief on the right, another on Joseph of Arimathea, and how that when you put yourself in the gospel story, that the story comes to life and it begins to have a deeper and fuller meaning for us. <clears throat> These, there's another way to focus on the hymns and the prayers. Um, of an Arsenius we're preparing uh, a book uh, for you that can also help you in history of the rites and of the hymns of Holy Week. Because the words uh, have a very significant meaning and we can't always take the opportunity to pause. Sometimes we do to, to explain what are those meanings. And if someone is very well uh, prepared for it, say before uh, you have the Kithronos or Avicinon or one of the other long hymns, it helps you to meditate and to grasp the fruit of what the church is trying to present during that time. Today, um, I would like us to focus on top topography or geography, primarily because it is so often neglected. It is a very challenging approach, but it also yields a lot of fruit. At Acts, we usually take a study abroad course <clears throat> that we can go through the different lands of the Bible and try not just to listen and read the Bible, but to see the Bible, to walk the Bible, and to live and experience the Bible. And this is not something that we made up. Actually, it dates back to as early as Christians began to write, that their experience when they would go to Jerusalem, how to understand and to grasp the meaning of every place. Um, so for those of us who can't go, and for, uh, for many for many, it is a very difficult challenge just to reach, uh, even in the ancient world, as much as it is today. Um, St. Cyril says that if we understand Scripture well, to grasp the spiritual meaning, to understand Christ in the Old Testament, you have to start by understanding the historical, the literal meaning first. Because if you make a mistake in the historical events, then uh, our spiritual reflection may not be accurate or beneficial. And part of this is to understand the geography of the land. And it, that's what I'm saying. It is a challenge. It is a difficulty for us. St. Jerome, he translated uh, the Bible into Latin in the 4th century. It took him about 23 years. And what helped him is to move to Jerusalem. He lived in a little, in a little cave. They still have it today. Uh, to help to translate um, into Latin. And after that, he spent another 15 years to do commentaries on, on the scripture. But being in the place had a, a very special impact for him 
And of course, it was access to some of the other Jewish scholars um, that could help him understand and to guide him in this process. Origen had the same. Uh, he spent uh, many of the latter years of his life for other reasons uh, in Caesarea. And he also had access to this. So this is um, one way where we're trying to grasp, try to understand the context and the situation of Jerusalem. Now, in 1187, Saladin, he had sieged Jerusalem, and Christians were no longer able to go to pilgrimage in Jerusalem for about 40 years. When they returned, the Franciscans in the 13th century, they developed a way by which people can do prayers and have short reflections in 14 different stations, as they called them, in the Holy City. And when people still couldn't go for other reasons, uh, you start to see in Europe in the 15th and 16th century, they start to have different stations that they would put around the church in different um, pictures or engravings, and sometimes outside the church uh, as what, different shrines. And this was a practice that kind of developed in the West. In the East, it took a very uh, a little bit different um, flavor. But this is maybe what you've heard of the Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering, which is the path they believe that the Lord Jesus Christ had went through in the city of Jerusalem. This is what it looks like above ground in some parts of the city. And this is what it looks below ground in other, other places, and not all of the, the ancient um, paths are still accessible today. Um, so there are different stations that are still there today, and you'll find people, if you go, praying in different locations. This location is of special benefit to us. This is Station 9, which is right outside the Coptic Orthodox Patriarchate. And in front of you, in front of this picture, you will see um, the actual dome of the Holy Anastasis. Um, as early as the fourth century, we have a very important writing by a Spanish nun who was visiting in Jerusalem. Her name is Egeria, or sometimes they call her Etheria. And she wrote about how the Christians were worshiping in Jerusalem in her time. It was after Queen Helen and Constantine had built some of the major churches, the Church of the Holy Anastasis, the Church of the Martyrium, the Church of the Holy Nativity, and some other chapels that were there. And she describes um, what we call, not stations, but stational liturgy. So they would pray and sing uh, and explain the events from the time, as you see here, of the last Friday, they would have a vigil, uh, until uh, Bright Saturday and the Feast of uh, Resurrection. And if you look in detail, you will see how that the Christians uh, were celebrating there and how the church incorporated some of these in our life and our worship today. So she starts by speaking of Palm Sunday or Hosanna Sunday and how uh, that they would chant, Flogimenos, uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they would have certain readings as they proceed from Mount Olives all the way down into uh, the uh, gates of Jerusalem. And um, this kind of gives us a picture of how the early Christians had worshipped in that time. They would even explain for people who uh, under, did not understand Greek or Hebrew and all of the other ancient languages to make sure that everyone there was able to participate fully. Um, the locations that she mentions, on Lazarus, there was a place in Bethany in the Nazarium. There were other places outside for Sunday that they would stop uh, for Palm Sunday. Also in, in Monday, they and they would have other locations around the temple. Uh, and in Bethany on Tuesday, they go to the Mount of Olives on Wednesday, Gethsemane on Thursday. And as you see, uh, each location they would have readings and they would have uh, reflections which prepared them to celebrate and to worship uh, in the church of uh, the divine liturgy. So most of these processions were done before the liturgy or they were done as part of the Vespers prayer. So I would like to speak this time more about the gates. The gates are mentioned about 362 times in Scripture. And while the word station is mentioned twice as a noun, one of them is mentioned by Nehemiah, which speaks about the stations 
of the people who are guarding the gates. And so these two are related to each other, the stations and the gates. Um, I want to briefly go through the different reasons why people would be in the gates. This is a picture of the Damascus Gate where people would fight their enemies. They would meet friends. They would make some deals sometimes. They would have judgment. And some people will even be killed in, near the gate. So it's a very important part uh, in ancient Israel. And it's an important part of scripture if we understand it appropriately. The first obvious meaning, the large walls were meant to protect the city. And the gates where the people would enter and exit and had their own way of defending those gates. The spiritual meaning that St. John Chrysostom tells us is that the soul is like this holy city. And it's protected by walls and by gates. And the gates are to be defended against and the shepherd. The priests help us to defend these gates from the passions and from the sins that can attack the soul. This helps us to understand when we go through the Sunday procession or the Sunday of the Palms, uh, where each station or each gate is a reminder for us there's a spiritual meaning behind each of these locations. There's also, uh, it was a meeting place, even when we go uh, with various uh, trips for, for acts, and that many times you will need to meet a group. Most of the time you'll be meeting in the gate, and this is one of the more convenient gates. It's very wide, because if you go inside, it's very hard to find someone. And so many people would uh, gather at this location. Um, and this is the meeting place that we have with God. And when we go through the different stations, each icon is like a gate that we will meet with the Lord and we will receive a message. The third one is the marketplace. If you look, when Abraham was trying to find a place to bury Sarah, he purchased the cave of Machpelah uh, outside the gate of the city. The same thing for uh, when Naomi was trying to sell her parcel of land after she returned to Israel, uh, that the elders were convincing Boaz to buy this parcel. And we know that Boaz is a type of Christ and that he, through this purchase, is actually saving her and saving the Gentiles, uh, that the Lord will come and save us by buying this land. We also are told in the book of Joshua that if someone had killed someone unintentionally, uh, they can be killed. Right? But to escape death, they will run to the neighboring city, and in the gate of the city, if they reach the gate, then they have refuge. They were not, you're not able to kill that person. So a gate of a city could be the place of refuge. It was also, on the other hand, if the parents were complaining about their disobedient children, they wouldn't just complain. They say, our son is stubborn and rebellious, and he will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. The punishment for that, do you know what it is? The picture, as you see. They would stone them outside of the gate of the city. We don't do this anymore. <laughs> because I was reading it. I don't know how many parents would opt for this. But this was written in the book of Deuteronomy. Because the evil of disobedience was so dangerous for the people of Israel. It's not just a matter of, He's not studying or she's not listening. But it's a matter of if they disobey their parents, it's a matter of disobeying the commandments of God. And that's why that was the threat. This was the threat. Um, so it's slightly different than the place of refuge. We are told that Lot was, stand, was sitting in the gate of Sodom when he saw the two angels. And this gives us a picture that because he was sitting in the gate, the angels revealed to him they are coming to save him. They are also, also coming to destroy the city. So inside the gate is the difference between salvation and between destruction, like what we also saw just a little bit a while ago. My favorite, which is in Jacob's ladder, when he 
has the heaven open and he sees the angels ascending and descending. <clears throat> He's on his way from Beersheba to Haran. And he said at a certain place, uh, when, he, when this vision happened, he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And sometimes we'll put this verse above the entrance, the royal entrance to the altar to remind us this is the gate of heaven. This is where the angels ascend and ascend. This is where God reveals himself to us. So this is the royal gate. This is the true gate for us. And when we look in the icon behind the altar, usually there's depicted for us of what we find in Revelation chapter 21 where we see heavenly Jerusalem, and it has 12 gates, right? Three gates on each side. And it's a picture for us of the cross, and we are told that they represent the 12 tribes of Israel, and that there are faces of pearl, um, made out of pearl, on each of those gates. And this is a very clear picture that the gates of Jerusalem point to the gates of heavenly Jerusalem. And if we understand the gates well, they, are, they allow us this entrance into heaven. So if we look and compare to the gates in the procession, we'll find that there are 12 stations or stops, 12 gates. And we find that many of these uh, names, you look on the left, is, are the names of the gates of ancient Israel. In the middle are the gospel readings that we say, and on the right is the spiritual meeting, uh, meaning that uh, is one of those six that I had mentioned. Um, there's not much time to go through each of these. I just want to open up some avenues for meditation for you. And the question uh, that I have is sometimes we say, which gate did Christ use? And there's a lot of scholarship on this. A lot of people meditate on the different gates. Actually, many of them are important for us, uh, and that's what the church is emphasizing when we go around in these different stations. So this Sunday, uh, today, we had heard in the morning that the paralytic man was at the sheep gate near Bethesda. Now, for many years, people questioned whether this was a true story or not. And, th and because of this detail that St. John mentions, in 1888, they discovered the pool of Bethesda near the sheep gate. And um, this gives us a very important place where we meet the Lord. You know why it was called the sheep gate? It's kind of obvious. <laughs> the sheep that were offered as a sacrifice were entered through this gate. And it's believed that the, before the crucifixion of the Lord, that he had entered through this gate um, to take away the sins of the world. When we go uh, in the procession, the sheep gate is pictured or portrayed towards the end. And usually they will even have the priest read, sometimes read that gospel in some of the, the church tradition because of the importance of this place of entrance. Um, and uh, it's a picture for us of the fulfillment of salvation. Other people, they'll point to the golden gate. The golden gate, or the eastern gate, is the one in which the high priest would enter. He'd enter into the temple. Again, we're not sure, but most people believe that this gate is the one that the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, when he came down the Mount of Olives in the Palm Sunday, the procession, that he had entered through this, just like the high priest who had entered into the temple. Um, and afterwards... I don't remember the year, but it was sealed, so no one would enter into it. And they actually named the two, it's a double door, the gate of repentance and the gate of mercy. Um, it was sealed, oh, 1530, you have here. It was sealed by the Turks um, just in fulfillment of the prophecy. They didn't do this. They didn't know about the prophecy. But he said, once the Lord enters, it will be sealed uh, for uh, his, and await the second coming. Um, there's also a fountain gate that we will read about next week, which is next to the Pool of Siloam. And most probably the blind man 
uh, comes outside of the fountain gate. The fountain gate is a picture for us of uh, baptism and of healing. And we read uh, in two places. We read in the baptism, uh, and we also read before the icon of St. John the Baptist, uh, which sometimes in, in, the, in the Coptic churches in um, the medieval ages, they would actually put the baptistry behind this place. If they, it was usually in the northwest, but if they couldn't, they would put it in the southeast uh, area. Um, so this is, this is what it looks like when you see the Lord Jesus Christ moving from one place to the next, especially on Great Friday. He will go through different gates and he will meet, whether it's Herod or Pilate or Caiaphas or uh, coming down from uh, Mount Zion to Gethsemane, that all of this movement, there is a lot of meditation that can, and understanding that sometimes is missing from our reflection in and out. Uh, but which gate are we standing in? So there is, like I said, different times, different ways to benefit from each gate. If a gate is the meeting place with the Lord, that we have something to do, a lesson that we are to grasp from these gates. There is an inspection gate where we are to see what is wrong. It's a place of examination, a place to see what we are lacking. We'll have um, at Archangel Michael, there is the reading of the parable of judgment. And that is put there so that we examine ourselves, make sure, okay, in, in our life, what will be uh, the state? How will God judge us when we approach the great judgment seat of the Lord? There is also the gate of refuge, which is what the thief on the cross uh, before, right? He sought solace and he was saved through his encounter with the Lord. Sometimes you meditate on uh, Barabbas, right? When Pilate asked the people, uh, which one do you want? want Barabbas or do you, do you, who should I release? Jesus of Nazareth, they said, no, no, Barabbas. And he was in the present not far from, so he could hear the people screaming his name. He didn't know why. The second question Pilate asked was, well, what do you want me to do with Jesus of Nazareth? The one you called him, he said, crucify him. So Barabbas, when he was in prison, he heard the two things. He heard his name and he heard crucify him. So he was thinking what? I'm going to be crucified. I'm, that's my judgment. And when the jailer came to him, he said, you're Barabbas? He said, yes. He said, okay, you can go. He said, what do you mean? I thought I'm going to be crucified. He said, no, no, you are free to go. This is the place of refuge. This was the encounter. And some people meditated on the life of Barabbas, who means the son of the father. His name means Bar Abba, the, the son of the father. Each one of us is just like him. And we should have been killed. And we were imprisoned. But the Lord, from his mercy, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, he saved us and delivered us from our death in the prison of sin. There's also in the fountain gate the blind man, right, who is washed from his sins. And this is, uh, like I said, the icon of illumination and the understanding of the Lord. Or there's the valley gate. When you look at, not our valley, <laughs> this valley gate, which is a representation afterwards is the desert. So we go to St. Anthony and we hear about the calling of the monasticism as a reminder for each one of us of the ascetic life and how that we are also called to the life of fasting, the life of silence, the life of reflection, the life of repentance. Where there's a fish gate, which we go to the apostles, and the apostles, they explain to us or show us the example of uh, the disciples of Christ who went and they preached and evangelized, and witnessed to the Lord. Um, so there are many examples I want to just leave you with one great example if you ever talk about Stations of the Cross, which is St. Simon of Cyrene. He's often neglected, not really spoken of much. They compelled him to carry the cross. And he wasn't desiring anything to do with what he thought was criminal. He was trying to take his family, his two sons, 
to go and to worship in the temple from his neighboring city. And this journey, what this man experienced, I, none of us, no one in history can explain. So I'm waiting for the opportunity to ask him many, many questions about how this went. What was the cross that saved the world like? The blood that was shed next to you, the journey that he made afterwards, I don't think anyone really understands or grasps this benefit. Like I think if he was standing here, we would want to kiss his shoulder, like you know how we greet with the monks or the priests. This is the greeting, this is why, because they are carrying the cross. But he carried the true cross that saved the world. And, and if we understand the stations very well, he lived, and he lived his, the rest of his life in order to proclaim what we all do as Christians. The, mean, the true meaning of salvation, that we are walking in our journey with all the battles and struggles and difficulties and uh, temptations. But if we understand what we are doing, yes, we are carrying the cross that brings forth joy, hope, and salvation. May the Lord bless us with every spiritual blessing. Glory be to now and ever to the age. Thank you, Sayyidina, very much for that uh, enlightening talk. Um, I'm very anxious to start Basra already, <laughs> um, but we still have to wait a couple of weeks. Um, just a couple of uh, announcements. I'm sure you received your little brochure. Yeah, we're twins. <laughs> but he's my father. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, have you received this? Can you find the QR code? <laughs> I'm sure it's very easy to find. Um, we need quest your, your questions, if you could prefer. To, um, we prefer that if you try to make it more according to, to the talk, uh, the theme of tonight, um, and we'll answer those first. But if you have any other unrelated questions, if there is time, we'll, we'll ask them after. Um, oh, one other thing. Uh, Sayyidna was mentioning um, some of the resources that... Uh, his Grace had, had put out a few years ago for the Passion Week. We have them upstairs in the bookstore um, based on uh, the commentaries of the Church Fathers, uh, based on the readings of the Passion Week. Um, <clears throat> so they're upstairs in, in the bookstore if you like. The cover. They're in four volumes uh, based on the different days. Any other questions? If you prefer to ask it in person, we can do that as well. Okay, I'll, I'll ask the first one. Uh, why were the parents using the idea of stoning against their children? So, in your so this was a commandment by the Lord in order to give that, um, to the reminder of the commandment, the, the, the commandment to honor uh, the father and mother. And so that's why it was, I, I think every parent probably threatened <laughs> and this threat, which was a real threat. Um, but, you know, as far as we know, in the history in Israel, we don't have many stories of when this was actually fulfilled. I don't know. Um, and actually, when you read it, I don't know how many parents <laughs> actually underwent uh, this. But it was the picture for us, like, like I said, of how the disobedience was the original sin of Adam and Eve and from which all of the other sins took place. So it was very, it was emphasized very, uh, very early on and very firm. Like I said, we don't, we don't really do that today unless you want to start that. Uh, so it's not fulfilled. But the concept is there and it's rooted in the sin of Adam. Anyone has any other questions relating to Passion Week or Sayyidina's lecture? Okay, we have a couple of others, but that's, that's about it. Okay. So the next question is, what is the church stance on abortion? Uh, what about in cases of incest or rape? So um, in general, I think you know that there is um, 
the, the rule of the church against abortion, there are some historical reasons why we make exceptions, and that's one of them, especially if there's uh, rape or, or other uh, situations, and they're dealt with very delicately. Um, and with with a lot of wisdom, and that's not just now. There were also exceptions in the canons um, early on. So we don't we don't invent these, but it's very um, it's with a lot of wisdom and discernment. Uh, even other cases, whenever there's a rule in the church, a general rule, that there are exceptions that are given for the bishop uh, that uh, is for pastoral rules and applied by the priests. So that's why our church is very uh, pastoral uh, in in dealing with it. It's not it's not as legalistic in the sense where you know you apply the canons without thinking. Um, so that's that's the wisdom of the church behind it. And person also not for the person to kind of determine themselves, uh, self predetermine what should be done. We all always have uh, to double check with, with our fathers. And that's why I said. In, in the spiritual life, the guidance of the Father of Confession and spiritual guide is, is always like foundation. Uh, is there a book on the gates, or is this a relatively modern and growing field? Sorry for lack of words, but all I can think of what field. So there's a lot of meditation on the gates, even from the time in ancient Israel, but the fulfillment of them, so you'll find, especially when you look in commentaries of Nehemiah, you'll find this, but like I said, it's not spoken of very often, partially as well because we lost that connection with Jerusalem for many years. We know that St. Evanesius in the consecration of the church of the Anastasis uh, when Constantine and King Helen invited everyone, so he attended, and that's why we have the Feast of the Cross uh, in the, the church calendar year. And so there were a lot of rites that were adopted into the church. But after, uh, in, when there were a lot of persecutions, and also, as I mentioned, uh, when Jerusalem kind of changed its dynamic, it was no longer a big center for pilgrimage for many years, uh, and there was this kind of disconnect. So that's why I think we, we don't really have that clear connection anymore, and we're regaining or recapturing. There are many, um, there are some books that are written on it, but like I said, I think we need, we probably need to do some work uh, so that people can read and, and uh, The next question. Um, to clarify, did early Christians tour the Stations of the Cross that Christ took? Is that where our modern day practice of the tour of Holy Week was derived from? So um, the stations that were in the early Christians, so starting from the fourth century, were primarily the cities that were throughout, um, starting from the last Friday of Lent until the Feast of Resurrection. On Friday itself, <coughs> uh, as far as we know, like uh, Egeria doesn't talk in detail about those stations. Those stations came in the by. Uh, the 13th century and 14th century by the Franciscan monks. But there were prayers that were done in the martyrium. So the martyrium is the Church of the Cross. It's actually um, an adjacent, directly adjacent. So it's a large area that Constantine built. And in the center is the place for um, the tomb. And they call it the Anastasis, the place of the resurrection. Later on, the Protestants mainly used the term as Holy Sepulchre which is, like, but it's primarily the place of the resurrection, not just the tomb. And then above it, so just a short walk within the main area, is the martyrium. Walk up some steps and you'll find the place of the cross. So that's where they had primarily the services as far as we know. Um, so there was St. Macarius of Jerusalem, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, of Alexandria, and St. John of uh, Patriarch John II of Jerusalem, and they're all mentioned in Senek Sar, and it's in their time that the practice what Egeria mentioned was developed. So once they started building all these churches, uh, then we they started to incorporate them in the worship. And we took, actually not just us, all of the ancient churches took some of these practices back home with them, and they put them in their Holy Week service. 
but like I said, we need some understanding how to grasp what came and why. And that includes, like when we do the 400 Montañas, or when we do uh, Golgotha, the hymn. Many of those things, like I said, were adapted and incorporated into our church to give us the understanding of what was going on there. Uh, just another question to piggyback off that. How certain is it that the Holy Church of the Sepulchre is where, truly where Christ was buried? So, so when you go anywhere almost in Jerusalem, you'll find uh, one location, two locations, sometimes three locations for the same event. So like, <laughs> as far as we know, for hundreds of years, there was one location. Since the time of Constantine, this is the place of the resurrection. Um, but some people didn't have access to it, so there were other Protestants who said, no, that's not the place, because all of the apostolic churches would be there for hundreds of years. So they found another tomb that was discovered a couple hundred years ago, and so they said, no, this is the real tomb. There, was, there were a lot of tombs in the area, but um, that's one claim that people have, and they'll show you a tour of an ancient tomb, which is very helpful and beneficial, but like I said, for more than 1,500 years, uh, this was the location, and you know the history as we have uh, incorporated for the Feast of the Cross, how they discovered the cross, and it was from that time when Queen Helen went. Um, and that story is reported by St. Macarius of Jerusalem. He was the one who told when, they, when, they, when she came, she's like, where is the cross? He's the one who told her. Uh, they have this tradition, so they began to take him. He brought the sick man, and then later, sometimes they say he's dead or near death, uh, and they put him on the, the crosses to know which one is the cross of the Lord. That's not just something in the Coptic tradition, but like I said, in the Christian tradition um, since the time of the fourth century. So it's it's one of the few things that you can, places that you can see in Jerusalem with, with accuracy, and that this is uh, as close, as, almost as close as you can get. When, when Constantine had built churches, like I mentioned, he, he only built a few. And one of them was the Nativity. So in Bethlehem too, they have a place from that time that and it was enlarged several times uh, throughout the history. So that's, that's pretty clear <laughs> for us. Uh, do any of the gates mentioned tonight relate with the verse from Matthew 19, 24, which states, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven? I believe they're both gates. Is there any correlation? Yeah, there are, the scholars have different opinions about that gate. We're usually taught that um, the eye of a needle was one of the gates in Jerusalem that would only fit and the camel would have to crawl. But so far, they have not, historians have not been able to identify where that is, if it even exists. And some, they say um, that when the Lord uses this example, um, the conclusion is that it's impossible. So a camel could fit through, like if you squeeze and push it, it's a thin camel. But the eye of the needle, there's no way, <laughs> right? So this was what the Lord was using to illustrate how impossible it is for someone who trusts him which is to enter the kingdom. Um, but if we do find it, I'll let you know. <laughs> they locate where the, they're, they're, they're uncovering things in Jerusalem every day now, uh, at least before in the war, when, when they're not fighting, and they're the ones in find something. Uh, I think the last question, just for the sake of time, um, how can I be ready and prepared to enjoy the Holy Week in a practical way? So in a practical way, there is a, what we are doing now. So there's fasting, right? There's Renatanias and there's your reading. So preparation for Holy Week, we had started a few weeks ago uh, for it. But I would say the more that, that you are engaged in get any reading that's related to Holy Week, and even map out the journey. So if you're going to travel uh, to Europe or any other place, right, you're gonna go and study a little bit, so that when you get there, you're not gonna waste time when you eat, when you sleep, but you're gonna plan out the journey. And the same thing for Holy Week, that you're going to say, okay, what am I going to read on this day, this day, this day? And, and what, what uh, things to highlight, so you'll get different guides for you, so that you can emphasize. I remember the first time when we went 
to uh, like for months, <laughs> like reading, to make sure that, that we don't want to miss any place. And what I found too, if you're faithful with this, God will let you kind of turn again, so you can see the other place where you couldn't. Because physically, you can't, you can't see all the places uh, in, in one visit. So God allows us to experience the Holy Week and to discover new things every year that we didn't before, on the condition that we are faithful, not just you know, coming here, going there. I went yesterday. I don't know about so, like, we take it, who knows, we don't know how many times in our life we'll be able to participate in one week again. Uh, so that's why it's very valuable for us who are eager to see. Thank you very much, Sayyidina, for the talk and for answering uh, the questions uh, very succinctly. Um, God willing, we'll try. I know we couldn't answer all of them, but I'll forward the questions to the committee, and maybe if there's time at the next meeting, um, we can answer it that way. Um, so we only have a couple more things before we go into um, the gym. We just have a, a small summary of a spiritual book, I guess, is the Grace Bishop Surreal decided that it would be a good idea to have a book club and to encourage one another um, to to read a spiritual book uh, relating to the theme of, of the time of this, this season this year. So we'll bring up uh, two of our blessed youth, Alunit uh, and Anna, um, to talk about the spirituality of fasting. This is Abanol. Um, we teach junior high here, so that's why we're here today. Um, so March's book club book was The Spirituality of Fasting by Pope Shenouda. So we're just gonna kind of go over the chapters really briefly, kind of reflect on certain quotations and kind of summarize it. It'll be quick. So chapter one. Okay, so chapter one is titled The Importance of Fasting. So it kind of just like generally goes over why fasting is important. And I kind of went through the chapter and something that caught my eye was the comparison of like fasting and transfiguration. So Pope Shenouda says, the three people who stood in radiance and glorious light on the Mount of Transfiguration were people who brought fasting to perfection. For every one of them fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Personally, I never thought of it like that. I never like made that connection in my head, so it was really beautiful to read about. He also says that this magnificent scene conceals behind it an important message. That is, by conquering the body through fasting, the spirit becomes manifest and the body is transfigured. And I think in general, just we fast so that we can be transfigured as well. So I just thought the comparison to the Mount of Transfiguration was very beautiful. Um, Eben was going to do chapter two. Okay, I, I really need to preface what I'm about to say with that. Uh, this is all Pope Shenouda. Like, I can't even practice anything that I'm about to talk about. Um, <laughs> so, uh, let's, uh, we're going to just talk about three major points uh, from Chapter 2. Um, and the first major point and the second major point, like, I think really go well together. Because if you understand the first, then you'll understand the second. Um, the first major point is hunger. Uh, many people, like uh, Pope Shunda says that when we're fasting, a lot of people don't let themselves get hungry. They just eat vegan food and then that's it. Um, but in, in those cases, they're basically just vegan people. He says it's not any benefit to them spiritually at all. Uh, the Buddhists are vegan. Uh, a lot of other cultures like are vegan just for health's sake. And so if we're just vegan all the time, it's not really of any benefit to us spiritually. He even defines fasting at the beginning of chapter 2 as fasting is abstinence from food for a period, followed by eating vegan food. And um, he spends like a solid 10 pages on the abstinence period. He doesn't spend any time on anything else like that in this book. So uh, when it comes to the abstinence period, he said it may be different for some people. Uh, he said that it needs to be longer in length than it is in other fasts. Um, 
says that these absence periods may differ in length based on the spirituality of the person, the age of the person, the health, uh, and what, like, how they work, because, you know, some physical labor jobs require more energy and therefore more food. Uh, he also says that the absence period requires a gradual progression to grow and, to, like, change. Um, so at the beginning of the fast, perhaps you start at 11 p.m., and then by the end of the fast, you're at 6 p.m., and that's how long your absence period is. Uh, simply so that you can grow spiritually and that you don't take on too much. In the end, though, he says that it all comes down to your father of confession. Uh, because if you don't have a father of confession and you're making those kinds of rules and judgments on your own, then you may overstep. You may try too much and fail and then just give up. Or you may try too much and make it and then it gets to your head like, oh, look at me, I fast till 6 p.m. every day. Um, and then others may go too little. Uh, and then they're not fulfilling their spiritual uh, potential. And they could have gone for a lot longer. Sorry. Um, he then goes on to talk about how after the abstinence period, several people just eat immediately. They're like, okay, it's 2 p.m., let's go, I'm just gonna chow down, and they eat a lot too. So that now they're full when this whole time they've been fasting. Uh, he doesn't recommend that. He says, go read a book. Like, go read a chapter or something. Go do some work. Like, take a break. See how long you can go. Don't just do the bare minimum of what your father's profession told you to do. Obviously, don't do, like, an extra two hours. But don't let the food be so consuming to you that, oh, it's 2 p.m., perfect, let's eat. Um, he explains that we should let ourselves get hungry. That, that we should hold on to that hunger for a little bit. That we should be pursuing being hungry. And that was like a really difficult thing for me to process. Um, but it's, he gives us examples. Christ fasted until he was hungry. It took him 40 days. Uh, I hope it, I don't know if any, you can go that long, I can't. Um, but afterward, he was hungry. It's in Matthew 4 too. Uh, so if God did it, if God went until he was hungry, who are we to not, you know? Um, and he blesses the state of the hungry. He says, blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Luke 4, 2. Um, Pope Shenouda then begins to make a claim. And it's actually a claim that he didn't back up too much. So this is kind of just trusting Pope Shenouda. Uh, but he says that the hungrier you are, the more fervent your prayer is. He says, two minutes of prayer when you're hungry are better than hours of prayer when you're full. Uh, if everyone here has attended one of those liturgies that ends at six and you're taking communion at six, um, never in my life have I actually thought of the communion as food. But when it's 6 p.m. and I'm that hungry, <laughs> my flesh is food indeed becomes reality because <laughs> I just am that hungry. Um, and he keeps going about hunger. Like I said, he spends like 10 pages on it and he doesn't talk about anything else that long. Uh, and then he asks a simple question. Why do we fast? But um, I think it becomes more evident why you fast when you're hungry. If you get to the point where you just want to eat and it's like, oh my God, when is this going to end? Then you're fasting perhaps for the wrong reasons. Um, or... So he claims. Uh, he tells us that some people fast to not look bad. Everybody else is fasting. If I'm not fasting, it's not going to look good. That's just self-preservation. That's just love of self. That's all about you. You're worried about other people judging you. And then he tells us that some people fast out of obedience. He says that this is good. Obedience is virtue. But it's not the point that we might be able to reach. He doesn't want us to stop at obedience. And then he says that some people misinterpret fasting and think of it as a self-inflicted cross because we're supposed to pick up our cross and follow him. And so now fasting is our self-inflicted cross so that we can follow him properly. And he says that these people are close, but they're missing the point. They're too focused on the physical element of fasting still and they don't quite get it. He says we fast because we love God. 
He says that there's no real way we can ever earn God's love, as we all know. Um, and that it's hard to directly show our love for God. And so fasting, denying ourselves, is one of the ways in which we show our love for God. We give up food and we learn to control ourselves. Because if we can control the thing that we need, then you know we can control ourselves and the things that we don't. Uh, and the last point that he talks about, and this is just a sentence. It's just one sentence, but it was it it, it really hard. Um, he talks about the difference between monks and laymen. He actually calls laymen pitiful. Um, um, and, and he says, he that, says they that they don't, don't understand, understand fasting, fasting entirely. entirely. Um, um, so when so Easter, Easter comes, comes, we're all going to feast. feast. I do not know, know what it is like at your house. house. I can tell I can you that my theta cooks for 40, 40 and 15, 15 people show up. Uh, so uh, it is a feast. feast. Um, um, and, and he says that that is not the point. That whatever we had gained spiritually, when we feast like that, uh, we just threw it out the window. It's gone. All of that spiritual benefit is now completely lost to us because we went too far. And we feasted. Those 55 days, they were meaningless. Um, it says to continue practicing self-control, when, even when we're not fasting. So when I read this line, I was actually upset and it took like two days to process before I calmed down. <laughs> He's like, no, we're supposed to feast. Like, it's a feast. Why burden us more? It was already hard. Um, and then I, I realized, like, hey, who the heck do I think I am? Because it's the Pope speaking. Um, and he's right. Because, like, once again, I'm just speaking for myself. At the beginning of every line, I start from the same place. I must have done something wrong. If I have to start from the same place every line, then I must have thrown my progress out the window. Um, so, just something to consider. Uh, and we're on to chapter three. All right, so chapter three is about how to consecrate the body through fasting. Um, kind of like Abhinav said, I literally just copied and pasted Pope Shenandoah because there's no way, there's no better way to like phrase what he said. So, there are like a bunch of questions posed in this chapter, and so I kind of snapshotted two of them. So the first one is, what then is an acceptable spiritual fast for God? And his answer was, it is one where a profound relationship with God is established. It is a fast where you feel God in your life. It is a sacred period which belongs to God and devoted entirely to him. Is it, a time when God, it is a time when God's presence is very visible in your behavior. It is a time with which your relationship with God increases and grows in a spiritual exaltation, which makes you long to stretch your fast and becomes endless. And I think what caught my eye in this response to that question is that the word God is in every single sentence. And so it kind of gets you thinking, if God is not part of every aspect of this fast, I'm not doing it correctly. And so that was kind of my takeaway. And so kind of rereading that, like every day, or whenever I need a reminder is really important, just because I feel like there's a lot of distractions in general. And so making sure that God is part of every aspect of this fast is a big contribution to how lasting its effects will be afterwards. And then the next question and answer that also caught my mind and like how to consecrate the body was, does God occupy your thoughts while you fast? And Pope Shenouda responds saying, during the divine mass, the priest cries out saying, where are your hearts? And the congregation answers there with the Lord. Likewise, I want to ask you the same question when you fast, where are your minds? Can you answer saying they are with the Lord? Is not a fast a sacred period devoted to God and one during, with, or one during which thoughts must be occupied with God alone? Examine yourself and determine if your thoughts wander during the fast. And so that kind of got me thinking to how I can check in with myself with that question, like where is my mind every day or every time I feel like it's kind of floating away from God being the focus. And I mean, I hope that when I do answer that question, it is with God. But even if I don't answer it that way, it can kind of like navigate me to focus back on God. And so I thought that was also a beautiful way to like make the fast consecrating for my body. And then chapter four just kind of talks about 
uh, virtues and feelings that accompany fasting. Uh, so I picked solitude. There was just like a bunch of different virtues listed and you kind of can just like look at one and see how you can kind of adapt that into your fast. And so Pope Shenouda says, in fasting, the Lord Jesus Christ retired to the mountain in seclusion with God the Father and devoted himself to contemplation. Our fathers fasted in the same way in the wilderness. As for you, retire as best as you can, and if you are forced to mingle, do it within the limits of necessity. Rid yourself of lost time in every trivial word. And I thought that was a beautiful way to benefit from the fast and to like build on our virtues, just because throughout the year we're surrounded by people, throughout the days we're surrounded by people. So really trying to like find seclusion with God. I mean, the closer we are to Him and the more it is just us and Him, the more our virtues will be solidified and like built. So I thought that was like a beautiful way to kind of grow throughout the fast, just to like find that seclusion, search for it, and kind of stay in it as much as we can throughout this period of time. And so that was just one of the virtues that I picked, but there's a whole lot more if you want to go look into those. Um, Evan is going to do chapter five. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, cool, cool. Uh, so, uh, chapter five, uh, he just lists a bunch of drills that we can do when we're fasting. Um, and so, one of the, the drill, one of the drills pertaining to repentance that caught my eye was uh, to take your point of weakness and make it the topic of your prayers and the target of your efforts during your fast. It says, to pour yourself before God and say to him, save me, O Lord, from this sin. I admit my weakness in this particular case and will not offer it without your help. Have mercy, O Lord, on my weakness and helplessness. Do not want to conclude this fast before this sin is eradicated from my life. He recommends we like memorize prayers such as this one. Um, and you know, say it every day. Uh, he gives us a drill pertaining to prayer. Um, train yourself to prolong your prayer whenever you find that prayer is about to come to an end, even for two minutes longer. It is important that you do not hasten to conclude it and leave the presence of God. Resist and continue even for a very short time. Then take your permission from God and end your prayer. Uh, and the last is pertaining to spirituality. Hymns and melodies carry the spirit of prayer, in which you feel you are communicating with God, which you recite from the heart and the soul, and which touch your emotions and affect your heart. Try to memorize the hymns that move you and repeat them often. Um, it's only five chapters. So, so that was chapter five. Um, just to sum up, fasting as a whole by Pope Shenouda. Um, this quotation kind of says it all. So yes, fasting is not merely a commandment from God, but a godly gift, a grace, and a blessing. God, the creator of our body and soul, knows of our need to fast for its benefit for our spiritual life development and our eternity. He granted us the knowledge and manner of fasting. As a kind father and a wise teacher, he has recommended fasting for us. Thank you. I recommend this book. Thank you, guys. Now you want to go read it. <laughs> um, thank you for your patience. We're actually almost done. Um, according to the schedule, I think we're about seven or eight minutes behind the schedule. So that's actually good for us. Thank God. Um, the last thing on your schedule is what? Career. Very good. Um, and so, uh, again, I think this was His Grace's uh, idea. Um, so not only do we have the book club, but we also have a practical, um, uh, well, the book reading is practical, <laughs> but also this is a career-based uh, understanding of maybe because you are uh, college students preparing your future careers, and maybe you want to hear something about um, a career that you or one of your friends are interested in. Um, so I guess today the career field is law. And so we have John Deshaies here to give us a quick explanation of the field. Sayyid Nakarov too, because he was also law. <laughs> Come on up, uh, John. Uh, before I start, is anyone like remotely interested in going to law school so we can 
besides book three. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So I was asked to. My name is John. I'm a second year at Chapman Law. I was asked to share some lessons I learned through the uh, law school application process and something I learned in school. So, uh, me personally, right? If you're an undergrad, my two things that really helped were for the LSAT, obviously preparing for the LSAT, and some experience on the side didn't hurt, even though you don't really need it. I'll try to go through this really fast because it doesn't apply to everyone. LSAT has like you know four sections. The first one is logical reasoning and analytical reasoning, and reading comprehension. There's a fourth section that's not scored. And there's a writing sample where they test your like legal argument capabilities. This is an example for like what they call logic games. It's kind of like a trademark of an LSAT question. So they're usually kind of fun if you're not timed, but in the LSAT context, they kind of suck. So it sounds like a library committee must reduce exactly five of eight areas of expenditure, blank, 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 and according to the following conditions. And then they have the conditions, and then there's a couple questions after. So yeah, so again, it seems fun right now, but when you're like on a time crunch, it's not. And so there's a couple like them, and there's like you know LSAT prep to give you ways to uh, you know follow follow like the patterns and do things like that uh, for admissions. So yeah, that's important because it's even more probably important than your GPA because uh, you know GPA is pretty like variable. You know, you've got different majors. There's no like prereqs for law school, so you can have like engineers competing with like philosophy majors like me, which isn't very fair in terms of GPA. So the LSAT puts you on like a you know level playing field. And so uh, if you type in any law school and 509, it'll give you these stats. And that can kind of tell you like, you know, if you're, so this is my school chapter. Uh, so it says the 75th percentile, I think it says 162 LSAT. Uh, and the GPA was 3.71 for the 75th. So that's, if you're in like between the 50th and 75th percentile, you're probably in a safe area if the rest of your application is solid. Uh, experience, so. For me, again, obviously everyone tells you you need experience, but for me, I remember I, I interned with a bankruptcy lawyer uh, in my sophomore year. I had no idea what bankruptcy law was. I just took the first internship I can get. And then uh, when I started law school, I actually got an interview with a bankruptcy judge, which again, I had no idea what I was doing until I actually started the job. And that opened the door to like my current position where I was at the uh, Orange County DA's office because I used that. So what seemed like really trivial at the time actually really helped me the resume and that. Uh, uh, or, volunteering. or volunteering, and obviously getting involved with any of the organizations, they have a lot of prep info and like talks like this. So, 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 so now that, no, no. No. for the rest of everyone else who's not interested, uh, one of the classes we took is called criminal procedure. So we were asked to give something that would apply to everyone. So since almost everyone gets pulled over, oh, nothing else in the class really applies to anyone else because the rest of it is like search warrants and arrest warrants. So hopefully, it doesn't apply to anyone. But for the traffic stops. Right, so most of the, the bulk of the class comes uh, is based on like parsing out the Fourth Amendment, which says you have the right. Let me summarize, right, to be secure against unreasonable search, searches and seizures. Right, so um, so from that you know concept comes the idea of a traffic stop and is it reasonable to be stopped and what can happen at a traffic stop. Uh, so you know we talked about seizures and searches. So the first thing is a seizure. So when you're stopped, that counts as a seizure. It's not an arrest, obviously. It's a temporary stop. Um, there's two you know, standards. There's reasonable suspicion and probable cause. You need probable cause to be arrested. For a stop, it's just you need reasonable suspicion for the you know, officer to interrogate you or do some type of you know, investigation into if he thinks there's a crime or not. You know, he doesn't have to have any proof yet. So, um, but again, it's not your job. The issue is a lot of people think it's their job to make legal decisions on the spot. You know, like when you're pulled over, look up something on Google. That's probably a bad idea. Just pull over, right? do what he tells you in the beginning. Right? You know, uh, obviously, don't get out. Show him whatever ID and documents he asked for. And then the first thing you want to do is make sure he gives you the, the reason. So I'm sure a lot of you have stories, but I know like people who have been pulled over for kind of like no reason. They kind of just want to check it out. You know, just, you know, just like put the flashlight in the car, things like that. So that's, that's not okay, right? If you, if you do that, you can, you can leave whenever you want. Um, and then there's like, you know, the opposite side is reasonable search. So because your car is kind of your property, it's kind of both. It's like you're a search like in your home and it's also a seizure. So um, yeah, you have to be polite yet firm. Because again, it's people are usually like one or the other, usually like, pushovers and really quiet or they're like really obnoxious and argue and it doesn't go well for them you know so you got you got to be polite and firm uh they can search your purse so a cop can anytime it feels threatened he can pull you out of the car and pat you down uh he, but he can't search your car still just your person uh unless you give them consent and so the issue with consent is it's never you know sweetheart can i please have consent to search your car it's more like pop open the trunk from you will yeah and then you say sure and that's that's consent you gave consent to him searching your car so some common misconceptions, a lot of people say, you know what, like, I know I have the right to remain silent, but why would, you know, like, I didn't do anything, like, for most of us, hopefully, we didn't do anything wrong, like, except, like, speeding or whatever. 
So if the guy says, like, you have drugs in the car, I, I have no, nothing to lose by answering that question. That's what people think, you know, because I don't. Or if you ask to search my car, again, I have nothing. I'm not hiding anything in the car, so I have no reason to uh, not consent. But we'll see why those two things. So I put two scenarios. Uh, there's, yeah, there's two main reasons. So people, two main reasons why you should keep this in mind. So the first, off, first reason is people like to enforce constitutional rights like the Second Amendment, right? People say, I'm going to own a gun just because I have the right to own a gun, even if it doesn't really matter. So that's one reason, right? You, you need to enforce this right just because if you don't, it's a user or lose it privilege. If you don't use it, uh, you know, cops can end up doing whatever they want and they will go back to like medieval times. And then the second reason is what you'll see in this scenario. So I'll start with scenario two. So this is the guy that's like, I've used my name, but this didn't happen. But this is the guy that knows his rights, right? He's very polite and like does like the annoying extra things that people think, you know, like lawyers are always dramatic and annoying because they're always like nitpicky. So this is the guy that does those things. So John is coming home from a night of kiak phrases that ended at 3 a.m. He drives slightly faster than he usually would at 70 miles an hour and in a hurry to get home and sleep. He unfortunately sees police lights and promptly pulls over. He remains calm and hands ID and documents to the officer when asked to do so. So this is the part that stays the same in both. Uh, then it says, the officer asks John, do you know why I pulled you over today? John replies, I'm not entirely sure, sir. The officer tells John that his tags were expired and to wait in his car while he comes back with a citation. He comes back and asks John where he's coming from this late. John replies, sorry, officer, it's late, so I would just prefer not to answer any questions and head home. The officer, surprised that John knows his rights, says, have you had anything to drink tonight, John? Can you follow my finger? John replies, again, officer, if I'm not under arrest, I would like to go my way. He is handed his ticket and heads home after a six-minute encounter. So this is, you know, you're not being extra. You're being polite and firm. As compared to this scenario, which is like, I don't want to scare you. It's not like super realistic, but it could happen. So this is when, you know, the honest guy, because we're always told, I'll be honest. This, what I heard when I was a kid is, you know, just, just be honest. And the cop will, will be nice. No, usually it's not. He's not trying, you know. like When a cop says, where are you coming from? He's not trying to be your friend. He's not trying to make a conversation. He wants to get extra evidence on you. He wants to do something like that. So. That's the reason why we say these things. So same scenario. John is coming home from a night of gap phrases and at 3 a.m. Drives faster at night, uh, 70 mile, 75 miles an hour. He sees the lights, pulls over, gives the cop his uh, ID and documents. The officer asks John, do you know why I pulled you over today? John replies, yes, officer. I was speeding and I know I shouldn't have been. I'm sorry. So this is the being honest part, right? The Christian part where we said we have to be Christian and be honest, which is all you know, good and well. But, but the truth is, it, being honest, by saying I'm not sure you are being honest because you actually have no idea why you got pulled over. You're, you don't know what he's thinking when you get pulled over. Uh, the officer tells John to wait in his car while he comes back with two citations, one for speeding and one for his expired tag. So this is just the comments. Now you have two tickets. That just sucks. It's not even about like a legal right, right? Um, he comes back and asks John where he's coming from this late. John is being honest and says church, right? The officer makes a, wee, a weird face, seemingly unconvinced, because 99% of the Christian population does not have church ending at 3 a.m., right? So, it's that. so the, the cop isn't convinced. He asks if John has anything to drink. John says no. The officer says, okay, I'm going to do a quick eye check. John's a little tired. He fails the eye test, the sobriety test, uh, and he performs poorly and gets arrested for DUI. Okay? So, again, it's not, it's, not like a super, it's not like a super realistic, you know, it's not going to happen every time. But it can, it can, it can happen. And the whole, point, the whole point of knowing your rights is, uh, is to make sure that these encounters don't last longer than they have to. So the whole point is, right, I'm being pulled over. I don't know why I'm being pulled over, right? I'm being pulled over. It could be for anything, not to search for speed. So for this example, it's expired tags. So now that I know why I'm being pulled, I asked the cop. He told me it's for expired tags. He cannot legally go beyond that scope in this interrogation. So he can't say, let me check him out, unless he has reasonable suspicion. So if he pulled me over for expired tags, my eyes are bloodshot, and I'm swerving. And he has other reasons. Yes, he can now interrogate me for UI or whatever like that. But uh, I, I messed up, or John, again, in this example, messed up by consenting to the test, like answering on you, right? This is why we tell you to remain silent. It's not, again, not just to be annoying. We're not giving you, we're not like just trying to give the cops our, and again, this cop isn't like, we're not saying these, this cop is a bad person. He's doing his due diligence and just sometimes like, it could happen. These tests aren't like 100% accurate, right? Like some people pass them and so people fail them sometimes. So it's best to avoid it if you can. So, and then uh, the other way around too, just because you know your rights doesn't mean you should always look to enforce them. So. When you're pulled over, you do have to show identification. If a cop talks to you on the street and says, show me identification for no reason, you don't have to show my identification. However, the cop could get really mad and say, you know what, if you don't show it to me, I'm going to arrest you for resisting an officer. And you, you show it to them, or you can, you can get arrested and you'll be fine. At the end of the day, you're going to be off the hook. 
but you're going to get arrested. You're going to have to go through the whole ordeal of a trial and all that. So at the end of the day, it's more of like you assert your rights. If the cop is not really, doesn't really care about your rights, then okay, you're willing to go, you can kind of comply and you can deal with it later. But for the most part, like any normal cop will be like, okay, he knows his rights. I'm going to leave him alone, give him his ticket, head my way. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Tim. I hope it, we still encourage you to tell the truth, but you don't have to tell the whole truth. <laughs> I think that's the, the main message. <laughs> uh, um, by the way, we, when we go after we conclude here, when we go into the gym for refreshments, um, we do also have a lawyer in the church if, if you want someone uh, 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 in, in the career. Um, uh, Ms. Vivian's here, I think. Yes. yes. <laughs> so she can answer your questions as well. Thank you, John. Um, any other questions? Issues? Hope you en enjoyed um, the, the meeting here. God willing, next time, His Grace Bishop Soriel will be at St. Justina Church, May 29th, at, also at 5 p.m. Um, and he's going to talk about the dilemma of transgenderism. Um, so we're, we're kind of covering all the various uh, topics that we can. Um, so after we uh, conclude, after his grace uh, blesses us, we're going to we, we have refreshments in the gym and activities, uh, and also some discussion opportunities with, with the clergy as well. Uh, okay. So um, yeah, Buna told me uh, for the next meeting, um, just stay tuned. Um, there's this is not completely confirmed um, for the church or the date or both. The date is confirmed, but the location uh, to be announced if there is any change. Okay. So that's why it's very important to make sure that you guys have signed up, um, up out in the front, so we can contact you uh, directly um, rather than waiting for for the announcements in the churches and so forth. Anything else? You guys received the, the Anafora emails? You are all received, so you open it? Okay, so whoever opened it and have any comments, please share with us so we can serve you better. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Yes, we're ready to include. We can stand up and pray. Okay. Kachietaris <laughs> Nempenyot in Metropolitis, Ava Serapium, Nempenyot in Ebescobos, Ava Surian, Nempenyot in Ebescobos, Ava Kere, Nosef Notente et Beveta Grovich, and No Ethronos and Hanish, and Rombinem, Hatseo, and Giri, Nikon, and Tevteveo, and Nodagiti, Sape Sit, and No Echalavian. Colem tove becheres to seria contev can and novi nane vulchen uhiri nikatabefne. Still night, yer aisun, yer aisun, yer aisun, In the Christos Benoti, King of Peace, grant us your peace, establish first your peace, forgive us our sins, for thine is the power, the glory, the blessing, and majesty forever. Amen. Our Lord, make us worthy to pray with all thanksgiving, our Father, who art in heaven.
And may the love of God, the Father, grace His only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, the and gift, fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with you, go in peace, and the peace of God be with you. Sorry, His grace was in the meeting, so <laughs> I apologize. Um, God willing, um, we'll just make our way this way, and you'll find the gym. <laughs>